Now, Konstantin Mishaikov, who is the next speaker, already has his slides online and sharing the screen. And so I think we are ready to start. Please, Konstantin. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, uh, the talks this morning so far have been, been very nice, very elegant. Um, I'm very excited about what I'm going to talk about, but unfortunately, uh, it's uh, both, I think, a combination of cool ideas, but uh, the details are, are really what's um, there. Okay. The details are, are what's important here. And so this is making it that the, it's made it very difficult for me to figure out exactly uh, uh, what to say. And so instead, I'm going to adopt a uh, point of view of uh, uh, kind of trying to give some highlights. And so I'm going to start with just a sales pitch. All right. And, and, and I'll try to be uh, somewhat truthful in my, uh, in my advertising. Uh, so the sales pitch is that if you give me a differential equation, uh, then I can solve it. And so in, in some sense, maybe what you should think of is that this is a, a numerical analysis talk. And as I indicate in the slide, that, that can be made possible by advances in computational homology and, and Conley theory. Um, now, it is a sales pitch. And you know if somebody's coming along and offering you herbal supplements, then there should be a, a warning that goes with it. And I have trouble with there. Oh, OK, so I've got to, I'm hitting the wrong button. Um, and so you know if, if this was an herbal supplement, you'd get some kind of warning like this. Uh, the more appropriate warning for this particular talk would be that uh, you know we we these statements have not been evaluated by a refereed journal publication, um, and that's because this is really very much ongoing work uh, with with a wide variety of people. Because as you will see in this talk, there's a lot of moving pieces, and various people are working on the different pieces. Um, Unlike the, the disclaimer that for the herbal medicines, uh, this product really is intended to uh, you know, characterize the local and global dynamics of a differential equation. But to, uh, to tell you what I'm gonna try to do, I have to deal with um, at least three points. And the first is what do I mean by solving a differential equation? Because uh, the definition of what it means to, to solve is not definitely not what a typical numerical analyst would think of. Um, I also want to tell you about the strategy and I only was given uh, 40 minutes to give the talk rather than 40 hours and so uh, I'm going to have to uh, only talk a little bit about the strategy. Uh, so in order to to get hopefully get some of the ideas across, what I'm going to actually do is rather than giving you details of the strategy, I'll try to give you a hint of, of what we can do today uh, and, and hopefully convince you that this is, is uh, a sales pitch that, that, uh, or a technique that maybe has some real promise to it. So let me start with what do I mean by solving a differential equation? And you know, my, my guess is everyone here is, has taken a differential equations course, uh, and most of you have probably even taught a differential equations course. And when you do that, you, know, you, you say, well, here's the differential equation, pick a parameter value, pick an initial condition, and then the solution is supposed to be a differentiable function. Um, and all of us probably know that the fundamental problem with trying to solve this problem is that in general, you can't find a useful analytic representation. Uh, and okay, so that's been known for, for a long time and it's given rise to the field of classical numerical analysis. Uh, <clears throat> and and so there are ways to solve it. I would say that the, the problem with this approach is that at least motivated from, from areas that I come from or I'm interested in say mathematical biology, typically the nonlinearity isn't really known. The parameters aren't uh, really known. And so having a numerical solution in this classical sense of a, given a single parameter value and a single initial condition just isn't, doesn't give a, a broad enough perspective on what the solutions look like. Um, of course, this is not something new. I mean, uh, the, the whole th qualitative theory of dynamical systems was developed in some sense to address this problem. 
And uh, so the perspective changes. And instead of trying to solve for a single initial value problem, you solve the whole problem. So you say, well, I would like to understand what happens to all initial conditions. Um, but of course, since you can't tell me what the analytic solution is like, then we ask about qualitative properties. So the focus now becomes one of identifying sets in phase space that are invariant under the dynamics. So these will be uh, sets that if you look at what the dynamics does, um, it, uh, it, it's unchanged. Fixed points, for example, periodic orbits, uh, but you can also end up with very complicated invariants. That's if, if anyone ever tell, talks to you about uh, uh, a chaotic attractor, then what they're really talking about is some kind of Cantor-like structure that doesn't get changed by the dynamics. Uh, and that leads to the whole, what I would say is a fundamental problem with this qualitative theory. And that is that it's just too rich. Uh, you know, if you have to kind of identify uh, Cantor set type structures, then that's going to be something that's very difficult, if maybe impossible to compute. And um, there's a general theory that, that says that if you're going to try to understand dynamics from this perspective and variant sets, uh, it's just too rich. There's just no way to, in general, be able to discern whether uh, two different dynamical systems are the same or not. Um, another issue that again has been understood over the last hundred years is that um, the solution set is extremely um, um, sensitive to changes with respect to parameters. So if you've solved the differential equation at a given parameter value, then for an arbitrarily nearby parameter value, uh, the, the structure could be dramatically different, all right? And so this makes it a very, so I, my claim is, that trying to understand dynamics on this level, uh, it again is, is from an applied perspective, it's just too sensitive. And now again, people have known this for a long time and Conley's approach, which was already uh, organized in, in the seventies um, was that rather than trying to look at all invariant sets, let's try to focus on very special invariant sets um, which he called isolated invariant sets. Uh, and an isolated invariant set is, well, it's an invariant set, but it has an isolating neighborhood. So this is some compact region so that the invariant set is the maximal invariant set inside that compact region and with the property that it lies in the interior of that isolating neighborhood. Um, so in particular, and, and let me make a, a sidebar for a moment, there's a particular type of invariant set that I'm, I'm going to focus on and that's an attractor. And a, an attractor is an invariant set, an isolated invariant set where its isolating neighborhood has a nice property that uh, if you look at the dynamics of this isolating neighborhood, the dynamics takes that neighborhood strictly inside itself. So if we're thinking in terms of differential equations, then maybe the nicest way to think about um, attracting blocks is a, a region where if you go along the boundary of the region, you see that the vector field is always pointing into that region and is pointing in transversely, all right? So keep that in mind. That's the kind of regions that we would like to, to identify. And if I look at the maximal invariant set inside that region, well, the flow is all pointing in, so it has to be inside in the interior, that maximal invariant set is an attractor. Uh, to keep things simple, I'm going to assume that there's a maximal attractor. If, if I don't make this assumption, then there's all sorts of technicalities that would have to be added to the talk. So let's just assume that there is a maximal uh, attractor. So there's some maximal compact set on which I care about the dynamics. The advantages of, of Conley's approach is um, that the typical invariant set is not isolated. So this, this approach uh, allows us to focus on uh, very special types of, of invariant sets. Um, and because they're some, so they're in some sense so rare, there's a hope that we can actually uh, uh, identify them. Um, the second advantage is that there's, that Conley came up with something that's now called the Conley index. And this is an algebraic topological invariant um, that provides information about the dynamics. 
And then the, the final point in terms of advantages is that talking about isolated invariant sets allows you to naturally talk about finite decompositions of the dynamics. All right, so let me, let me emphasize a little bit more about parts two and three. Uh, and so uh, what is the Conley index? All right, so again, this is a, a subject that I could you know, talk for, for a semester about, uh, but for the purpose of this talk, uh, I want you just to think, and this is sufficient. So think about having two attracting blocks, K0 and K1, so they're nested. And then the Conley index or the homological Conley index of the maximal invariant set in the difference is just, well, just compute the relative homology of this pair, all right? So I've given you a, a definition that, that in principle is very computable and a lot of what this talk is about is to try to be able to identify attracting blocks, not from an analytic perspective, but from a computational perspective. So I'd like you to think about having a combinatorial representation for attracting blocks. We'll eventually get there. And if I have combinatorial representations in terms of cell complexes, uh, then this is something that is pure, that, that's, we're in the realm of, of um, combinatorial topology, and so that's something that's easily computable. Now, the Conley index is really useful because it can be used to identify and, and characterize dynamics. And the fundamental fact, and this is due to Conley, is that if something has a non-trivial Conley index, then there must, in fact, be a non-trivial isolated invariant set associated to it. Uh, there are more refined versions of this idea. Um, you know, you can find fixed points, periodic orbits, et cetera. So the, but the, the moral that I wanna get across, cause I don't really care about these details at the moment um, is that homology, perhaps in the form of the Conley index, plus typically to get these kinds of results, you need a little bit more gives you information about dynamical systems, all right? So algebraic topology in the form of homology is sufficiently powerful to get the kinds of results that people traditionally who are doing dynamical systems might be interested in. Okay, so that's the Conley index part. And then there was this decomposition part, again, a la Conley, because we're focusing on isolated invariant sets. Um, and we can talk about a Morse decomposition. And so you should think about this as a finite collection of partially ordered disjoint isolated invariant sets called Morse sets. So maybe over here in this picture on the right, think of, of each of these nodes as being an isolated invariant set. Uh, and they're organized via, uh, well, there's a, this, you can see a partial order put here. Uh, and this partial order has the property, and the Morse decomposition has the property, that if I start with an initial condition and I look at where it goes in forward time, it ends up in a Morse set. If I look where it goes in backward time, it ends up in a Morse set. And, uh, and that ordering with respect to the temporal ordering is compatible with the partial ordering. So again, if I'm looking back here and I have this, um, this uh, more set here and I do a perturbation from this more set, then it's impossible for me to go from more set number 11 to more set 15. Now in this drawing that I have, I've on the left-hand side are all these numbers where for some reason or other, I've numbered the more sets that way. Uh, and what you're seeing here in these, these triples, you can think of those as the Betty numbers of the Conley index when I've taken that relative homology. The reason I, I emphasize the Conley index for this Morse decomposition is because, and I'm just gonna state this as a fact, if you have a Morse decomposition and you have the Conley indices of these Morse decompositions, of these uh, Morse sets, um, then this gives rise to a homology theory. And, and the homology theory, well, it has to have a chain complex. And in this case, the chains are the Conley indices of the Morse sets. And then there's some boundary operator. The existence of this boundary operator was proven by uh, Bob Franzosa in, in his thesis. Um, and so I'm gonna, and this, this boundary operator is, is called a connection matrix. And so what I'm going to declare is that if I can hand you a connection matrix and this chain complex, then I have solved the differential equation. All right. And the reason I'm claiming that I've solved the differential equation is because, well, I'm telling you about 
a Morse decomposition or else I wouldn't be able to write down these chains. I'm telling you about the Conley index of these Morse sets. And I've told you that the Conley indices of Morse sets can be used to understand properties of the associated invariant sets. And then this boundary operator says how everything fits together, all right? And so at least from a qualitative perspective, I've given you a lot of information about what the, the dynamics is, both locally within the Morse sets and globally how the Morse sets fit together. So that's my definition of solving a differential equation. All right, um, let me kind of recap this slightly differently. So what I'm saying is that, that from Conley's perspective, what you do is you fix a specific parameter value. I'm trying to solve the differential equations. Fix a specific parameter value and look at the collection of all attractors for the dynamics at this particular parameter variable. And this parameter variable, and this, um, this turns out to be a lattice. It's a countable lattice at worst, um, but it's a, a, it's a lattice of invariant sets. Uh, of course, attractors are defined in terms of attracting blocks. Uh, and so there will be a collection of attracting blocks that gives rise to this collection of attractors. This turns out to be a lattice again, but it's typically an uncountable lattice. So it's absolutely huge. Um, but there's a nice map. It's a lattice morphism that takes us from this huge lattice to the smaller lattice. Uh, and... Uh, it's, it's natural with respect to the dynamics. What you do is you take an element of this lattice, which is an attractor block, and you just let the flow move you forward. And after you've done this for an infinite amount of time, you will end up with an element of the attractor lattice, which is a, an attractor. Right? Now, this is supposed to be a talk about numerics. This is supposed to be a talk about solving differential equations. Uh, so there's no way that I can work on uh, with infinite uh, collection of items. So what I want to do is I want to say, well, let's restrict ourselves to looking at, at finite subsets. So for example, if you hand me a finite sub lattice of this lattice of attracting blocks and you use this lattice morphism, then you must end up with a finite sub lattice of the lattice of attractors. Um, but, at, at, okay, so that's an obvious statement, but what people are really interested in or people who traditionally do dynamics are interested in is they're interested in these attractors. They're not so much interested in the attracting block. So the question is, if I gave you a lattice of a finite lattice of attractors, would you be able to identify it via these, this uh, uh, lattice of attracting blocks? And the answer is yes. And so this is work done with Bill Calise and, and Rob Vandervoorst that says, if you have a reasonable numerical scheme then if you give me a finite sub lattice of attractors, then there exists a way, a way to realize a finite uh, sub lattice of attracting blocks so that taking the lattice morphism, the omega limit set uh, is actually an isomorphism. Um, now, you might be a little bit concerned about the fact that the previous slide I was talking about Morse decompositions and now suddenly I've gone back to lattices of attractors. Um, and, but you shouldn't be because in fact, uh, a Morse decomposition and a finite sub lattice of attractors are effectively the, exactly the same thing. And Birkhoff's theorem is what tells us that we can go back and forth between these, these two structures, all right? And again, there's a paper, a recent paper with Bill Calise and Rob Vandervoorst where we make this, this precise. Uh, on one level, this goes back to Conley. He was very much aware of the relationship between uh, attractor lattices and, uh, and Morse decompositions. Uh, but in this later paper that we have, we, we make this much clearer. Um, okay, so that's kind of what we've, we, uh, you know, this is kind of a recap of where we are now. Back to the idea of computation, what bothers me if I'm looking on the right-hand side of this is that, you know, attractors are invariant sets, and I've tried to argue that invariant sets are very hard to get your hands on, even if they're only fewer ones because they're isolated, but they're not stable with respect to perturbation. So an, an arbitrary small perturbation of the parameter value can lead to a very different structure of the actual invariant attractor. Uh, and so this be, the working on the right-hand side is very hard if you're gonna try to do computations. 
On the other hand, attracting blocks are stable. Again, think of what I told you when I told you about attracting blocks. The way to think about them is it's some region in phase space. So the vector field is transverse along the boundary. Um, but if it's transverse along the boundary and you perturb the vector field, you'll uh, the transversality will be maintained. And so uh, that that's basically a proof that attracting blocks are stable with respect to perturbation. Since these are stable with respect to perturbation, since given an, a, a finite la sub lattice of attractors, you can realize it numerically via some finite sub lattice of attracting blocks. What I'd like to propose is that maybe we should think of these objects as the objects of primary interest. Um, and that's really kind of the, the whole, uh, the meta idea of uh, this numerical method that I'm proposing. And uh, um, notice that as soon as I do this, I'm no longer have to talk about a specific parameter value because attracting blocks are stable. So if I've done this computation at one parameter value, I actually know that it's true for nearby parameter values. All right, so that's an, I think it's a nice idea what I'm proposing, but it, you know, if it's actually going to be a practical value, then I can't just talk about stability. I actually have to have quantitative statements about the stability. All right, so so how are we going to get that? And this now becomes a lot of details, very interesting details, I think, but they are hard details, and so I'm not going to be able to talk about them in in today. Um, but I can give talk about the strategy. Then the idea is that we start with the ODE. Uh, from the ODE, uh, I need to go into a region where I'm going to do computations. And so I'm going to take the ODE and I'm going to produce something that I call a rook field. And the rook field is a purely combinatorial object. Um, from this rook field, I'm going to extract a combinatorial representation of dynamics. Um, Again, from this combinatorial representation of dynamics, I'm going to do um, computational topology, combinatorial topology. And for lack of a better uh, uh, name, I'll call it homological dynamics. So this is a bunch of objects that we're going to extract from the dynamics, and I'm going to care about their pro homological properties. Uh, and then I'm going to compute here and I'm going to pull out something that I call a Conley complex. So this is a purely combinatorial uh, object chain complex. Um, and I'm going to say, oh, once I've done that, I've solved the ODE. Now, that should be bothersome because, again, I've taken my ODE, I've turned it into some combinatorial object, and now I've just done computations on a combinatorial object. So I have to prove to you that when I claim I found a solution that I'm really talking about something that means something to the ODE. And this has held us up for a long time. We've known how to do at least these homological computations for decades. Um, what we've kind of come or the, the approach we're taking right now is to introduce something that we call the Janus complex. And it's a Janus complex because it serves two purposes. In one direction, whoops, in one direction, it, it, uh, it relates to these combinatorial homological structures. And the way it does that is that for every structure here, there's going to be a corresponding structure in the Janus complex, and then you prove that they're chain homotopic. So whatever homology you're computing over here, it's the same homological data over here. Uh, but what I'm going to do with the Janus complex is that I'm going to think about its realizations as regular CW complexes. And it gets realized in the phase space of the ODE. And then I'll be allowed to do analysis on this realization. And from this analysis, I'm, I'm going to prove that this solution that I have back here is actually the correct solution. In other words, the Conley complex that I've computed here is equivalent to the, the Conley chain complex, the Conley homology that I talked about earlier that, that Bob France also did. All right. So again, uh, uh, just a, a comment here. This, this stuff in the, in the purple here, these compu this computational box, we're trying to keep that as absolutely as simple as possible so that we can do the computations as efficiently as possible. And what held us up for a long time was that we were trying to go directly from the structures here to the analysis. Uh, and that 
turns out to be very, very difficult. And by making this Janus complex, and this Janus complex is huge compared to this complex, uh, we have a lot more flexibility to do the analysis. And I'll, I'll touch on that at the very end of my talk. So I would love to be able to spend a lot of time talking to you about the details, but uh, you would have to be as thrilled about this as I am if you wanted to plow through it and we don't have time, so you're saved from that. So instead, what I'm gonna to try to talk about is what, we're, what we can do today and, and talk about results that we can get today. So uh, what I'm gonna to talk to you about are ramp systems. So this is a class of ODEs, and I'm gonna to try to convince you that it's a pretty general class. And so maybe it, it actually uh, is general enough that it, it allows for solutions to general ODEs. So a ramp system is a differential equation, a system of differential equations of this form. Notice that there's a linear part to the differential equation. Uh, what I care about mostly is that, that this linear part has a diagonal form. Uh, and then there are the nonlinear terms, the E sub n's, and those will be defined in terms of ramp functions that I'll mention in a moment. Um, notice that I've already introduced n parameters. Those are these decay rates that are right here. All right, so I've already introduced n parameters into this system. Um, I included this uh, slide just in case anybody's interested enough later on to go back and to read actual details. What I want you to get out of this is that there's something called a ramp function and it has a, a, a type j. And what type j means is that there's j theta values in here. Uh, and it's a function, well, from the positive numbers to the positive numbers. Uh, I've done this just because of the motivation that I mentioned earlier in terms of biology. Uh, these might be densities of species. Uh, but the ramp function of type J has 3J plus one parameters. It's much better to look at a ramp function from this perspective. So here's my ramp function of type four. There are one, two, three, four values of theta. Uh, and then there will be five regions where the, the function is constant. Uh, and then there are these ramps where you change from the constant values. And then there's the thetas are in the middle of the ramps and H, the H parameters just tell you how wide the ramps are. If you think about all functions that can be approximated by ramp functions, then if you have smooth functions and you can do an approximation of pretty much any, uh, any smooth function uh, using these ramp functions. And the nonlinearities that we're going to work with are um, expressed in terms of sums or products of ramp functions. Now, the key thing is that I'm only allowed to use a ramp function of a particular variable once. So here's some you know, nomenclature. RNM means that this is a ramp function that is dependent upon the nth variable, and it's used to define the EN term. So here are examples of ENs, you know, here I've taken a ramp function that's defined in terms of the first variable and the third variable, added them together, that's fine. I could have multiplied them together. I can do, you know, sums and products. Uh, so it's a pretty general class of, of, uh, of functions that I'm allowed to work with. But again, the key point is that I'm only allowed to introduce one, you know, if I pick a variable XM, I'm only allowed to introduce one ramp function of that's dependent upon XM. <clears throat> okay, so that's a huge class. It's lots and lots of parameters. What I'm going to want to do is to go from this class of ODEs into this thing that I call Rook fields. And to do that, I have to talk about parameters. And those parameters are going to be called Rook parameters. And the Rook parameters that I care about are the, the, the thresholds, the thetas and the values at which the, 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 the function takes. So it's a huge product of parameters. And then the, um, these, those gammas that were those decay rates. So this is the Rook parameter space. So back to the strategy. What I've done is I've defined ramp systems for you. And I wanna go from ramp systems to something called a Rook field. I'm not gonna tell you about the Rook field yet. Um, but once I have the Rook field, then what I want to do is to, um, uh, to tell you what the solution is. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to say, if you give me a ramp system, I'm going to tell you what the solutions are. So, and these are theorems. What the, the content is that we've able, been able to go over to the right-hand side via these Janus 
complexes and do the, the embeddings and then do the analysis. And so I can claim these as theorems. So first theorem is you give me a ramp system. Then remember, these are the, the ramp parameters, all right? And what I claim is that there's an explicit, and this is very important that's explicit. I know exactly what these, uh, these semi-algebraic subsets are. I lied there. I know how to compute them, um, what these semi-algebraic subsets are. Uh, these are nice semi-algebraic subsets in the sense that they, they represent almost all of the, the ramp parameters because their closure is the set of ramp parameters. Uh, and what I care about these uh, is that if I take an upsilon in this upsilon star set of, of rook parameters, then I can define this object that I haven't told you yet what it is, what, that's a rook field. Okay, we're in that purple box now. I'm in that rook field box. Uh, and so given a rook field, what I claim is that I can compute a Conley complex. All right, so how you do that is in this paper that just recently appeared with Sean Harker and, and Kelly Spenlove. Um, what you end up there is a chain complex. And I am hoping that the notation is very suggestive. This looks like a direct sum of Conley indices. Now, there's no dynamics here. This is all purely combinatorial, but I've computed objects. And these are going to be chain complexes, should you think, should think of them as Conley indices. And there's a boundary operator associated here. All right. So again, I take an upsilon that's in this uh, semi-algebraic subset of rook parameters, and I run it through our machinery, and it produces this thing that's a Conley complex. And again, the third part of this theorem is that there's in fact an explicit subset of the H values. The H values are the widths of the regions where I have the ramp, all right? So the H's you know, tell me how wide these ramp regions are. And I can explicitly, I can give you ex an explicit subset here with the property that if you choose a ramp function with the, the H values in here, uh, then if you've done this computation, then I've identified a Morse decomposition, I've computed Conley indices of the Morse sets, and I've determined a connection matrix. In other words, this information that comes out of this algorithm is actually the information that Bob Franzosa would have computed uh, in, in, in his thesis. All right, so, so I'm claiming therefore that because this information is the same as this connection matrix information, I have solved the differential equation. Um, here's a remark, again, truth in advertising. Um, th this theorem is correct without this star. It's just that if we're working with systems where n is bigger than or equal to four, so higher dimensional systems, then I know that at the moment we are not fully exploiting the rook field information. Uh, and so we're losing information about the dynamics. All right. So I'll give you an example where we get the complete information from the dynamics, but I'll give that in terms of a two-dimensional example. And for the higher dimensional problems, uh, we still have work to do in order to make sure that we're not losing information. Uh, the second theorem, which is at least as important, if not more important than the first one, is that if I consider a ramp system, in other words, I'm fixing the dimension, I'm fixing the ramp functions, uh, which are the, the J's, uh, and I'm fixing the choice of the E. So, you know, take those ramp functions and decide how you're adding or multiplying or, or what combination of that you're, you're doing to produce the E's. Uh, then there's a finite set of computations that you have to do. And we know what those computations are with the following property, that if you took any one of these upsilons that is in this region where you can do a rook field uh, and you computed the Conley complex, then, well, if you had done this original big computation, you would have just found, you would have already have found the, the answer. So there's only finite number of computations that have to be done in order to solve a given ramp system. Uh, important remark is that uh, for a broad class of ramp systems, we've already figured out what Z is. We know that explicitly. Um, what do I, what's, I, and, really is, depends on sparsity. So for example, if you give me an arbitrary ramp system uh, where each of the ENs depends on at most 
four uh, other variables, then I can tell you immediately, essentially immediately, uh, what uh, what the z is. Uh, notice because there's only finite amount of computations that have to be done. Uh, this says that these computations are very robust. And so if you think about giving an arbitrary differential equation, say smooth differential equation, uh, then you should be able to approximate it arbitrarily well by a ramp system. And so in some sense, I'm claiming that, that you know, my, uh, my sales pitch is not really so unreasonable, uh, but we have not yet uh, figured out how to systematically exploit this robustness. All right, so there's still a, there's still a lot of room of development to show that we actually have a reasonable numerical scheme. Let me do an example. So here's a particular ramp system. I've given you four ramp functions. Uh, what I'm going to do for the first uh, uh, ramp equation is I'm just going to add these two blue ramp functions together. And for the second one, I'm going to multiply these two ramp functions together. So this is a particular ramp system, and this would happen to be one of those particular ramp systems where I can make a rook field, and so I can carry out all the computations. Um, if I think about the, the, the ramp system abstractly, where I'm saying, okay, take j equal to one for each of the uh, ramp functions, and uh, make and, and have a two-dimensional system, and in the first E1 do an addition and an E2 do a multiplication, uh, then I can tell you that there are exactly 25,600 computations that have to be done until you've understood the dynamics for all these kinds of systems, all right? And actually these computations can be done extremely fast. So that even though there's 25,000 of them that need to be done, it's, it's, it's very easily done. Um, so, okay, so let's go back and let's fix these parameter values and run it through our computational machinery. And, oh, this is the same picture I showed you earlier, except now there's no, con there's, uh, there's no dynamics in this picture. What this picture is really is a post set, partially ordered set. Um, and these are nodes in a post set. I've ordered them. There's an, uh, I've computed, Remember, I told you I could compute the Conley index if I had a nice combinatorial representation of uh, attracting blocks. Of course, I don't really have attracting blocks, but I have a combinatorial representation of the attracting blocks. And so each of these, in some sense, represent, not some sense, they really represent uh, computations of relative homology on this combinatorial level. Um, and the theorem that I've, I've, I've done says that, uh, um, that when I compute the, this Conley complex uh, based on this information that I've actually solved the differential equation, which means that these must be the Conley indices of Morse sets, all right? So the fact that this Conley index is non-trivial means that there really is a Morse set in the system uh, that has this Conley index. And from this, I would be able to ex uh, extract, for example, that there has to be a fixed point. And this kind of looks like an unstable, uh, uh, like a saddle point, all right? Now, you might say, gee, can you show me a picture of the differential equation? Uh, I would say, no, you don't want to do that because every time you change parameters, the actual trajectories and the actual locations of the fixed points are going to change. If you wanted a conceptual perspective, well, you could think of this as a geometric representation of the, of the combinatorial dynamics, uh, but don't get too hung up on these, these edges and boundaries of these, these uh, combinatorial representations of the trapping re of the uh, attractor blocks, uh, because for the actual differential equation, this is not the right picture. But basically, you know, this looks like a stable fixed point. This looks like a, a, a source. This kind of looks like a saddle. Um, you know, here's another saddle that goes to two sinks uh, and they're color coded. And, and, and so you can kind of think of this as a cartoon picture of what the dynamics are doing. But again, all the, connect, all the Conley indices are non-trivial. And so I really have come up with a, with a Morse decomposition for the system. What's very interesting here is that, in fact, there's two Conley complexes that get computed. 
Uh, if I step back and I tell you, remind you that everything is, all this parameter space is decomposed into semi-algebraic sets, then there is a semi-algebraic set, I know it explicitly, for which this computation is valid. And in that set of parameter values, both uh, uh, connection matrices are valid. And if you have multiple connection matrices, then that really strongly suggests that bifurcations are possible. And in fact, in, in work that we're doing with an undergraduate student, we have actually shown in this 18 dimensional region of parameter space that there is a 17 dimensional uh, subsurface along which a saddle saddle connection occurs. Um, I don't really know a nice way to represent 17 dimensional spaces, um, but this is in some sense very easy to turn this information into labeled data. And so we can plug this into machine learning and get the machine to start giving us a nice representation of surfaces along which bifurcations are taking place. And that's something we're exploring right now. All right, so the point is that for this simple example, I'm able to, to solve it. Um, so back to the notion of the strategy, uh, what we've done is I've said, look, here's a differential equation. I plug it into this machinery by somehow getting a rook field and out comes a solution. And then the theorems told me that those solutions were actually solutions for the LVEs. So I'd like to finish up in, in the, uh, do I, yes, let me do very quickly, tell you something about the rook field. So uh, this is gonna be very fast because I'd like to leave time for some questions. So the idea of the rook field is, well, if I'm working with an n-dimensional ODE, then I'm going to take the thetas essentially and use the thetas to define uh, a subset uh, um, an integer lattice. From that integer lattice, I will build a cubical complex. Um, you know, so edges and, and cells are all defined in terms of this integer lattice. And the rook field is going to be defined on, on walls. So a wall is a top dimensional cell and a face, a co dimension one face of it. All right. And the rook field says, give me all these pairs. And for each pair, I'm going to assign an n vector of zeros plus or minus ones that have to satisfy certain conditions. I do want to point out that the amount of information that's going into this uh, rook field is less than the, uh, you know, the information that you might think if you were just thinking about how fast does this complex grow. Um, this rook field is defined locally. Again, that's an important point. Uh, I only need to understand local properties. And basically the idea is, you know, if this is a picture of my top cell and its wall, and here's the rook field there, uh, then that rook field can change uh, in this neighborhood uh, as I change from, from uh, uh, top dimensional cells and their co-dimension one faces. But the point is that I, I'm only gonna allow it to change in one direction as I cross through one of these hypersurfaces, all right? So along this fate, because it's changed from the first coordinate has changed here, the only the first coordinate would be allowed to be changed if I move from there to there. So it's defined locally, but uh, I have to have global compatibility. Okay, so that's modulo, the details of the definition, that's the basic property that the rook field has to satisfy. Um, what I hope I already made clear is that top cells play an important role um, and if I'm going to talk about a, a cell in there, there's going to be inessential directions of a cell, right? If I was in a two-dimensional complex, then this edge has inessential directions and it has e essential directions. Um, there, I can talk about positions of a cell versus other ones. Why am I doing this rather than just talking about the pictures? Because again, this is all purely combinatorial. Uh, I mean, all these pictures are just to help me keep track of what's going on, but, but everything is, is absolutely combinatorial. There's no geometry at this point. What we've learned, we've been working on this for almost a decade now, and, and what we've learned is that if you try to put geometry in too early, uh, you just don't get anywhere, you get stuck. If I have a rook field, then I can actually extend it so that it's defined on, on all kinds of, of cells and their top cells. 
Um, and then using this, we can talk about exit faces and entrance faces. So for example, if I wanna understand how sigma and, and psi are related, uh, well, I look at all the top dimensional cells that are associated to these pairs. And if all the arrows, if they're gradient directions associated to that, then I don't wanna, I don't wanna contradict those gradient directions in the lower dimensional cells. So that's a notion of an exit face, there's an entrance face. Um, we care about, you know, if I give you one of these cells now, uh, then I look at all the top cells associated to it, then I can talk about all the possible values that the uh, Rook field takes on that. Um, and that we call the range. If the range is nicely consistent uh, in a certain direction, then we'll say that's a gradient direction. Uh, if it's not consistent, but it's co completely not consistent, uh, along the inessential directions, then we'll say that a cell is opaque and we'll call a cell an equilibrium cell if it's opaque and if it has no gradient directions. Otherwise, it's a regular cell. Okay, I've thrown a lot of information very rapidly. There's no way that I expect you to have remembered all of this, but what I do want to point out is that what we've done is to use the Rook field to provide local labelings of cells. And from these local labelings, I build a combinatorial dynamics. Uh, the simplest is if I'm at a cell, I have the opportunity to go to myself and I have an opportunity to go to any cell that I'm a face of or any cell which is a face of me. This is kind of a meaningless uh, rule. It's just the starting point and the way I'm going to get useful information out of my dynamics is by performing refinements. And then we have a series of rules that go through uh, you know, looks at exit faces and takes away different edges. There are more rules that get applied um, for, for, you know, if you have regular cells, then I'll tell you, again, a certain way to get rid of edges. Uh, again, these are all lots of technical rules. Um, what I will say is that if I stop at this restriction right here, then theorem one applies in general. It's the, it's proving that the following, the additional rules that I'm putting on uh, actually give rise to proofs about the ODE that we're still working on, all right? And finally, you get down to where I'm trying, I'm at an equilibrium cell and I'm trying to understand how edges, uh, uh, what edges should be allowed. Um, and we, at, at, this is one of the real obstructions to going to higher dimensional cells. After you've done all of these, after you've done a set of a subset of these restrictions, uh, then we can talk about the lattice of forward edge variance. And so if I've given you the script F, then here's a definition. We can very efficiently compute this set. And these are these combinatorial attracting blocks from which I can compute com the indices. Um, and then we move to the homological dynamics. We need to have a blow up yeah. complex. Perhaps bigger comp we need to, to, to reach a conclusion now, Constantine. Yes, I am. This is literally the last picture. Uh, and you can see that when you move, to, whoops, when you see that you can see that when you move from the blow up complex to the Janus complex, uh, things get much, much more complicated. All right. But this is how you do the analysis on the right hand side. All right. And I apologize for. Uh, for taking a little longer than I expected. Questions? Okay, so thank you very much for the talk. There's a question already by, by Vago Wei, so please, please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, it's a great talk. Uh, it appealed to me your method can be used for lattice Boltzmann. There's a lot of people work on that. Um, yes, I, I think that at the moment, the biggest constraint Okay, so there's the analytic issue of trying to get the proofs. Uh, the biggest constraint is dimension, right? I mean, we really are extracting a lot of information about the, in, the, the exact structure of the dynamics. Um, I'm pretty confident because of work that, that Kelly and, and uh, Sean have done that we can get to 10 dimensional systems. Um, but uh, if we get to the, you know, these big high dimensional systems, I, I think our computational techniques might be, be severely stressed. Everything can be parallelized, but you, know, you get combinatorial growth and complexity and, and only linear speed up by parallelizing. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I don't know how, how high a dimension we can get with these techniques. That's my, my biggest concern. 
Okay, next quick question by Madzie. Um, hello, and thank you very much for your talk. I have a question about Morse decomposition. I would guess that it is not unique for an attractor. Um, so is there any way or algorithm to make this, uh, the number of Morse sets in the Morse decomposition optimal or then the corresponding lattice optimal? No, I mean, I think this is the power of what Conley introduced, right? In, in principle, you can make a system that has infinitely many more sets, all right? So there's no upper bound on the number of more sets. And right? by optimal, I mean minimum. I oh, mean you can always make a minimum one, which is just a single more set, but now you've lost all the interesting dynamics, all right? So, so it really is... Uh, um, non when I told you that I don't know how to do this, that there are limits to what we can do at the moment, that I know that I'm not pulling out the optimal information from my rook field. Um, and that's precisely because I know that I'm not producing a Morse decomposition with enough structure. What's happening is that some of my Morse sets are collapsing when I don't really want, you know, instead of having two Morse sets, I get one Morse set because I'm not extracting enough information. Okay. Okay. Thank you. One, one very quick question by Vidit, and then we move on to the next talk. Okay. Very quickly, can I read up the details of this Janus complex somewhere, or is it not yet available? It's not yet available. It's uh, I we're pushing really, really hard to uh, to get the proofs. Yeah. Okay. With okay. with Thanks. with remark, let's let's say Constantine for a very interesting talk, opening a new perspective in, in solving dynamical systems conceptually and numerically.